Brief introductions. I'm Nathan DeBoer. My wife is Lori. We're mostly back there, occasionally up here. We have three kids. Kate, who has Ben and the kids back here. Um, Josh, who's married to Mackenzie, Glenn and Christie's daughter. They're the prodigal children that are away on sabbatical. <laughs> and Nick and his wife Hannah, who live in Stevensville, but are also prodigal children and go to a Cold church down the road. <laughs> no, that's not true. They go to roots. They just like a little more excitement than you can offer. Um, Glenn's been pestering me for years to do this, off and on. Well, not pestering, but okay, pestering. <laughs> um, and honestly, I, I haven't done it not because I didn't want to do it. I've done it because I didn't know what to say. Um, I haven't understood my testimony forever until recently, and I just couldn't put it into words, and it, it wasn't going to make sense to you if it didn't make sense to me. So about three months ago, God woke me up at four in the morning, and I was not happy about that. Um, I tried to go back to sleep, and he just kept saying, now. And I'm like, oh God, why? Why couldn't it be four in the afternoon? But it was four in the morning, and so I got up, and sat down and started typing on the computer. And I'm gonna read you guys what he gave me. Um, other than fixing grammatical errors um, and adding a few little things, um, this, is, this is how he gave it to me to give to you. Um, and to myself, I think, mostly. Um, and also by reading it, I'm going to avoid the habit I have of forgetting things, going back, and giving you guys flashback whiplash. <laughs> so, off we go. As I've contemplated my testimony for a long, long time, I've been reluctant to try and put it down or explain it. Maybe because I saw no defining moment and that made the whole thing rather ambiguous. Maybe because I was afraid to face some of the things it would show me about myself. <laughs> Maybe because I just didn't understand it. And if I didn't understand it, how could anyone else? One thing that has held me back is that there was no defining moment that I could see. For many, there is a spirit-filling moment, and it's easy to see and tell about. They seemingly went from black to white in an instant, at least as far as salvation is concerned. For others, though, it's not that way. It's a lifetime of events that make up an ongoing story of God's work in our lives. From God's perspective of our eternal security with him, there was a black and white moment. But for some of us, it's less clear when that moment was, though in hindsight, that event may become clear. That's how mine is. Not a defined instant, but a life story that God has had his hand in and is not finished with, but has only just begun. That's why I prefer to call this a life story. It's my testimony of what he's done for me, but more than that, it's a life story of how he's done it and is doing it. There have been a number of movies and books over the years that ask the question, what if? What if I had done this or that differently? What if I had or had not gone to that place that night? What if I had said that differently? What if that one tiny thing had gone differently? Would my life be different today? I have often looked back with that question in mind when the reality is I should have been looking forward to the consequences my current choices would bring. Our lives and the paths we end up on are often defined by just a very few specific moments or events. The events, however, are seldom random, but often consequences of choices we make based on a number of things. Worldviews and God views we've accepted or been taught, peer pressure, pride, envy, lust, greed, poor friend choices, and sometimes circumstances beyond our control, like where we were born, raised, our family heritage, and the beliefs we started early life with. And sometimes things just seem to happen to us for no apparent reason. All of this God can and does use to shape our lives. And if we let him, that process is much less painful. Though my life as a whole has been generally shaped and molded through the prerequisite things, there are a few more prominent tipping points that have had a great impact. I was born into a Jesus-believing home that went faithfully to a Jesus-believing church. Although I saw some evidence of true faith in my parents, for the most part the others in church were Sunday Christians that exhibited little evidence of a walk with God throughout the week. Growing up, there were a few adults in church that walked the talk, but in my peer group of teens there were none. 
My parents, for whatever reason, chose to say very little about my friends, who I was with, or what we were doing. And consequently, I hung out mostly with some that were less than inspirational in my walk with God. More often than not, I was the conscience of the group, and a poor one at that, with many gray areas. I did, however, often listen to that prodding inside to do the right thing, and had a vague awareness of God's presence. Often that prompting to do things God's way was ignored, not in great go-to-jail type ways, but in the greater areas. For whatever reason, I'd been brought up with a mindset that the little sins of life didn't really matter, and after all, God forgives them all. That mindset would come to have disastrous ramifications later in life. As bigger things became little things, the gray areas became less and less defined, and the downward spiral got more and more blurry. Anyone that's ever started down sin's slippery slope will understand how unclear your choices start becoming when once you open the door and peek down the path. Sin sucks you in and takes hold and grows so slowly you don't even notice its blinding and deafening, deafening effects. And ultimately, if left unchecked, it drags you so far in you can't see the way back out. And you really don't care anymore, much like a frog in a pot of gradually boiling water. When I think about what sin can do in the life of someone that knows the Bible and believes in Christ, at least mentally, clearly knowing right from wrong, I'm amazed at how well this world is held together without Christ. That is one obvious proof to me God's word is written in all of us, knowing right from wrong, whether we acknowledge him or not. So back to the start. I've historically had a perceived memory of salvation around 10-ish, possibly implanted because I had never been told, because I had been told over and over that if I was a Christian, there had to be a specific and defined moment in life when that decision was made. So that's the time I remember making a proclamation of Christ as Savior. I'm not sure if this moment ever really happened, looking back, but I did grow up with a definite head belief in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for my sins, and likely this is the time I made a conscious head decision or acknowledgement of the sinner I am and who Christ is and what he did. I don't now hold that to be my saving faith moment. As I now look back, I think for a long time my belief that I had made that once for all choice and achieved that salvation moment allowed me to rest in my security and have a lazy walk with God, if it even was that much. In my view, I was a Christian and certainly one of the best behaving Christians I knew. And well, after all, God will forgive me, even if I don't bother to live for him. Everyone kept seeing the magic church talk about saying a prayer, accepting Christ in your heart, and you'd be saved. That is great, and in its fullest meaning, accurate. Unfortunately, nobody ever talked to me about the difference between agreeing with the facts of his sacrifice <coughs> versus trusting him in my heart as the Lord of my life. My salvation in early life was in my head only, 18 inches off the mark. It wouldn't be until my early 30-somethings that I began to see the difference. As I grew through my teens with that mentality, I became more callous, and my desire for self and the things of this world grew. Yes, like most males, I like stuff. I'm a stuffaholic. By my early 20s, my life seemed complete with what I had made of it. A good job, good friends, all the stuff I wanted, along with the debt. But I was increasingly aware of something I didn't have. All my friends had, and they were now married, and I wanted a wife too. So the first one that pursued me got the chance to try it. It was a disaster from day one, which was inevitable, since it had been a disaster from our first day. The only marriage advice I had gotten before and after was, it'll be hard, to, but it'll be hard, but divorce is not an option. Both true and definitely what I believed early on. But with no other help and tools, a non-existent walk with God, friends lacking moral character, and a family that mostly minded their own business, divorce suddenly was to me the only option. There were the righteous few that told me over and over that I couldn't do that and none of them were willing to put any effort into helping me make the right choice. I was angry and disillusioned enough that I was ready to prove to all of them that I very well could end that marriage and would do just that. After all, she left, I didn't. Was what was once a black and white concept in my head had never made it to my heart and was now just a gray area to be twisted however it suited me. When after a few months of wanting to kill each other, Mrs. X went home to Mama 
and many months later refused to return, I made the choice to end it and move on. Knowing it was not a good choice, not God's choice, but in my pride and anger, doing it anyway. Previous compromises on the little sins had set me up for this now to be another little sin that I was willing to accept. It was an immature decision to get married to start with, one I wasn't spiritually or emotionally ready for, but one that I was able to convince myself and everyone else was the right move. Why in the world everyone around me wasn't yelling at me to run, I really don't understand. But most likely, it was because of the world I had surrounded myself with, lacking any sense of God's standards. Satan likes to turn the simple forks or choices in the road of our lives into roundy rounds to confuse and perplex us. If we don't have a clear map of the road, God's word, guidance from the spirit, and a desire to choose the right road, we haphazardly end up distracted and without direction and easily go the wrong way. I wish I could say I gained a lifetime of wisdom from that year and grew immensely in my walk with God, but if anything, I was more hardened and determined to do it myself. Being the stubborn person I was at that point, and to a far lesser degree am still, I was determined that marriage could still work for me, and it didn't take long for my friends to find someone. I don't know if they felt sorry for me or if they were tired of babysitting, because they did babysit me. But they all were searching pretty hard. I'm sure God has worked many miracles in my life, most of which I've been oblivious to. But looking back on this, God used a terrible sequence of choices on my part to put Lori in my life at this point, before I completely destroyed myself. I was looking for a Christian lady, but little did I know what he had in store. From day one, she was a God-fearing lady that held me to some measure of accountability. The fact that she went on a second date with me shows an amazing amount of grace. <laughs> Given that our first date was the only time in my life I can say I was drunk. <laughs> and oh, was I drunk. <clears throat> he must have had something to teach her too, and a great sense of humor. She's not perfect, but she knows right and wrong and wasn't afraid to tell me when my choices were a bit lax. She says I tricked her, and I say she chased me. But either, year, either way, one year from the day we met, we were married. I now had a new marriage to a wonderful wife, but I carried my old self into it. It didn't take long before my unrepentant heart and self-centeredness had set this marriage on a path to destruction also. I selfishly did my thing, and she was left to do hers, and we basically cohabitated. To call it a marriage would be a stretch. As I pursued my life without including her, we became increasingly distant. I didn't really notice what she was going through, being in my own little world, but she was miserable. By God's grace and her obedience, she stuck it out, though. I know she often questioned why. I didn't have any destructive vices like gambling or drinking. I did, however, have one that I'd always had, selfishness, and it was growing. My life was spent working and doing the many hobbies I wanted to do, none of which included Lori. She was working and cooking and cleaning and soon raising children and wondering what had happened to the dream I convinced her I could fulfill. One of the early things I decided to try out was to play the piano. So off I went on a quest to teach myself, just for fun. I'd grown up in a fairly musical family and seemed to have a little innate ability, so the basics came pretty easy. And with some lessons here and there and hours and hours of daily practice, again without any thought to Lori, I was soon in a small band that had formed out of our home church group. It was a huge amount of fun and soon grew into leading worship at church. I had convinced myself and many around me that I was doing it for God and his church. That may have been partially true, as I think God was stirring something in me at that point. But I was mostly doing it for me. It was a way I could do something for God, and that was fun, and seemingly of service to others. My heart, however, still wasn't right, and though it was for a great cause, I wasn't spiritually ready for it, and was still oblivious that I was shutting Lori out more and more. What I tried to start as an exercise in serving God ultimately led me to more and more pride, which in turn drove a wedge between Lori and I. I now had my music friends, and she was home with the kids, and I had no time left for her. The commitments grew, and the time serving God grew, and my disregard for my marriage grew. During that time, I was also convinced in my arrogance and pride that I was impervious to sin and temptation. Whether God intentionally showed me I was wrong or simply let my pride play itself out, I don't know, but oh my goodness, was that wrong. 
I had set myself up at that point for a disastrous shipwreck and I didn't see it coming. The one person in my life that cared enough to guide me was Lori, and I had shut her off almost completely. I was, after all, a lifelong Christian, a worship leader, a deacon, and in my pride, immune to any attacks by the enemy. Even if I was vulnerable, I was convinced the other church leaders I had around me were watching out. I would soon find out they were completely clueless. As with my first marriage, blindness and my casual attitude to a compromise here and there led to more and more gray areas until I was in a fog so thick I had little awareness of right and wrong. Without going into the details of the train wreck I had initiated, I can now look back and see God was calling me through that time, likely yelling at me. But the noise of my sin, pride, arrogance, whatever else, had become so loud I could barely, if at all, hear him. And I certainly didn't want to. God had given me a desire and talent to use for a noble cause, and I had allowed that to be used by the enemy too. This would, however, prove to be another defining moment in my life that God turned around and used for good by his grace before the damage was permanent. Lori had far more intuition and a much greater connection to God than I ever thought possible in this mortal life. There came a point when, through circumstances I can only attribute to God's prompting her, she became aware of what was going on in my life and called me on it. Suddenly I was exposed for what I was, a lying, cheating, ugly mess of a person. My initial reaction was to run, but the fog lifted quickly and some awareness of reality set back in. I had been contemplating leaving her, and through my pride may very well have, had she not lived out her faith and obedience in God. I now can look back and hear God's voice in my conscience telling me leaving wasn't the answer, but I certainly didn't perceive it in the heat of the battle. Thanks to God, Lori was trusting him through it all, though I'm still amazed. I know she felt completely alone and abandoned, but she held to the measure of faith she had and trusted him. I'm paraphrasing since this is all a blur, but in essence, she told me she was angry, hurt, betrayed. She didn't know what she wanted, but she knew what God wanted. So if I wanted to leave, she wouldn't stop me, but if I wanted to stay, she would let me. I doubt she had forgiven me at that point. But those words, whatever they were, showed a love and trust of God I had never seen from anyone in my life. I put my pride aside long enough for that to sink in over the next few days, and I became more and more aware that she had something I wanted, a true relationship with God. I've only recently understood how that desire took hold. It took years for us to heal, and there are still scars. But again, God used my faults to mold me in ways he couldn't get through to me otherwise. It was through that display of unconditional love by Lori that I finally glimpsed the God my head had believed in, and now I was willing to submit my heart as well. I can look back now and see the change began, but it didn't happen overnight. And there were no fireworks, and there was, nor was there a night and day conversion moment. Although I had now accepted, although I had now accepted my faith and submission in Christ in my heart as well as my head, and it took many years for him to whittle away at my old self. The bent toward pride and self-centeredness was still there, and often came out, though less and less as time went by. We did various marriage conferences and counseling, which all helped in little ways, but ultimately we needed a fresh start, and what could be fresher than moving to Montana? To that point in my life, I had said I would never leave the area I grew up in, but as God prompted little changes in our lives, like a different church, actually many different churches, new friends, new goals, that resistance to change faded away. At one point, I finally admitted maybe we should just move away. And before I knew what hit me, Lori had us touring the Northwest in search of a new home. I will admit it wasn't the easiest thing I ever did, and I'm sure I made her wonder if it was worth the trouble at times. But in the end, we settled on the Bitterroot Valley and made the move. The first few years here were difficult at times. I was cranky and overly concerned about our business in Oregon. I guess I didn't fully trust that God was in control, or at least that I wanted to let him be. 
So there was some doubt and uncertainty about our life change. After a short time, Lori decided I needed a distraction. So she got me a camera, thinking it would be exactly what I needed. A focus on something else. I wasn't initially too enthused, but soon did some shooting and allowed the fun of it to run wild in my life for a while. I tend to be rather obsessive compulsive, some of you may know that. So it actually kind of took over my daily activity for a couple of years, making Lori wonder what she, what she had done, and the kids thought I had just lost my marbles. I often dragged her out for hours at a time to take pictures. She loves nature, so although she was a bit bored, she was happy to tag along, and we were doing it together. Thankfully, the obsession finally wore off, and I settled into enjoying photography, but not being consumed by it. We weren't here long before we decided church hopping had run its course and Jesus Community was to be our new home. I had maybe subconsciously and maybe purposely put piano playing aside years ago. Scared of what I had let it become in my life and unwilling to face the person I had let it turn me into. So I hadn't played but a few times in the last 10 years. It wasn't the music that had been so destructive in my life, but my willingness to feed all the other sinful traits I had with it. I had many demons to work out before I could worship God that way again, and I just wasn't willing to face them. Our kids really aren't, weren't, aren't old enough to remember Dad playing piano in Oregon, so they had little inkling that I ever played much in the past. They did, however, know that I could plunk out some sheet music. So one fateful Sunday afternoon in December of 2017, my always up for a challenge daughter and daughter-in-law, affectionately called Dill, daughter in law <laughs> We're trying to work up a song for the Christmas Eve program. Not so gently requested I play it with them. A couple of pleas to give it a try broke me down, and when I played with those two amazing voices, it was like the demons fled. And I felt truly inspired to play again. That would prove to be another defining moment in my life. That was the start of a genuine music ministry for him, not for me. And it is again something I really love doing. I do daily have to give it to him and am constantly aware of my need to keep my focus on him and my propensity to drift back to myself. So here I am today, bent, broken, put back together with a few scars, but living for Jesus. I've been slow to embrace and learn from nearly every lesson he's given me, but he is faithful, and I am determined to finish this race well. Many moments and events have defined my life, and although I squandered more of them than I can count, God is faithfully using the lessons I let him teach me through to mold me more and more into the son he desires I be, the servant, father, and friend, and husband he wants me to be. One of the many life lessons I'm convinced uh, is that God's in charge and has all things in his control. And that is especially true in the lives of his children. My life hasn't happened by chance, luck, or coincidence. Everything happens through God's hands, either he brings it in our lives or he allows it, both to mold and shape us into what he desires us to be. Experience now tells me the process is far easier if we listen and obey the first time. And so, back to what if. I used to contemplate the what-if questions based on the material things this world offers. What if I'd made another career choice? What if I was born into wealth and fame? All about wanting more in this mortal life. As I've matured in Christ, my temporal what-if questions have mostly gone away, and the ones that are left have changed to <coughs> more of an internal nature. What if, after all these years of living for me, it's not re really about me? Because it's not. What if I gave it all for my wife, my family, my friends, those I meet? Through him I can. What if Christ hadn't gone to the cross for us, but he did? What if I give it all for him? How about today? How about right now? I now focus on the amazing blessings that God has given Lori and I in this life, trials and all, and hope to grow in him through all of them. So what's the next step for Nathan and Lori? I have no idea. But I know it's together, and I sense God's hand working, pushing, pulling, directing, and I'm now listening. It's not easy. In fact, it's difficult. But here I am, Lord, using. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs>